having me, everybody. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. So uh, I guess the first thing I have to say is uh, it is, I live about maybe um, a mile from Dodger Stadium. So uh, it's in the 90s today. It's like in the mid 90s. I almost feel like I'm out there with you all today. Uh, even though uh, we're here in LA, uh, I'm happy to spare the, uh, share the space with you virtually uh, just to spend part of your afternoon with you. Um, to give you a formal introduction, uh, my name is Barry Chivira, uh, Assistant Director, Undergraduate Admission at UCLA, and uh, I get the privilege of working with students uh, across San Diego and Imperial Counties. So I get to be your liaison, and I want to be able to work with you, and uh, hopefully you had the chance to get my contact information, but I'm happy to share that with you in just a little bit. Uh, what I want to do is go over some slides. I also want to make sure that I just kind of um, uh, have some other links nearby and have some other information just so I can uh, provide that to you later on. But uh, what I wanted to do is just kind of welcome you virtually to campus. This is Jan Steps. A lot of people recognize Jan Steps uh, as one of the signature portions of a UCLA tour. I know that it's hard to uh, come out to Westwood from Imperial County. Uh, so I want to just try and give you a best, uh, the best possible experience virtually. Uh, in my virtual background behind me, that's Royce Hall, uh, one of the more iconic places uh, on campus. So uh, just trying to give you a good sense of what campus looks like. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, uh, you might be hearing from a lot of the other UCs, maybe you've already heard from them when you've attended the, uh, their presentations. Uh, we are the smallest uh, of all the UC campuses in terms of physical size. So when you take a look at the other UC campuses, eight other UC, uh, UC campuses are much larger than UCLA. So we have just a little over 400 acres. So in terms of uh, physical size, we're the smallest. In terms of the um, student population, we are uh, the largest uh, UC in terms of uh, population, a little over 40,000 students. So I wanna share a few other things with you. Uh, one of the things I wanted to do first was just kind of call out some familiar names and faces. Uh, you might know them as uh, leaders and pioneers. We like to think of them as former Bruins. Um, UCLA was home to uh, Eleanor Ostrom, first woman to win the Nobel Prize in economics. Uh, she's still the only woman to win the Nobel Prize in economics. Uh, Ali Wong, uh, I know a lot of us are in quarantine right now, so someone like her, uh, you might have seen some of her work on uh, Netflix. Uh, she is a very popular uh, writer, uh, actress, and comedian, so she's got a lot of uh, material on Netflix. And then two of the more influential leaders, uh, mayors of Los Angeles, uh, Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa and uh, Tom Bradley, the first Black and uh, Latino mayors of Los Angeles. Uh, at one point, Time Magazine called uh, Mayor Villaraigosa uh, one of the 25 most influential Latinos uh, throughout the entire United States. Uh, and Tom Bradley, a uh, pioneer in social justice, uh, first black mayor of Los Angeles, and he served five terms. So he was mayor five times for the city of LA. And before many of us were born, uh, he was able to bring the Olympics to Los Angeles way back in 1984. So uh, if everything goes well and uh, there's uh, an improvement on how we treat COVID, uh, the Olympics will come back to Los Angeles in 2028, so uh, LA gets to host the Summer Olympic Games uh, eight years from now. So these are just some familiar names and faces. I think we also wanted to bring up some of these other folks as well. Uh, Christine Simmons, she is the, uh, 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 the Chief Operating Officer of uh, the Los Angeles Sparks. Uh, Juan Felipe Herrera, the nation's first uh, Chicano Poet Laureate. Um, he is not at UCLA, but he is, uh, he's from UCLA, but he's teaching uh, at another UC campus. So uh, I wish he was still a part of our campus, but he's still in the UC system teaching elsewhere. Uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, NBA all-time leading scorer and African-American history scholar. And uh, I saved my Mbialik for last because uh, a lot of viewers in this room might only know her from her more recent success, but people like me, uh, we remember her, I remember her from uh, Blossom, which was her first TV show way back in the uh, um, late 80s, early 90s. So uh, back then, uh, after Blossom ended, she actually came to UCLA, uh, not just as a student, but she got her PhD and her undergraduate degree in neuroscience. So for those of you who only know her from her more recent success with Big Bang Theory, she actually knows what she's talking about. She, uh, she's very much a nerd in real life. Uh, we've been happy to have these uh, students on our campus. They've gone on to do great things. So we're hoping that one day uh, you can be featured uh, in the same way these uh, former Bruins have. So I wanna uh, take a look at some other information, uh, perhaps if not for you, for your families, just to give you an idea of some of the things that we've been capable of. But uh, success comes uh, not easily. It takes a lot of hard work, but our, our students uh, have uh, a lot of success. And you can measure that in a lot of different ways. 
uh, in terms of completing your uh, degree at UCLA, more uh, than 80% of our students finish in four years. So it looks bad for a lot of universities when it takes you longer than four years to graduate. So, uh, you know, some of you might have AP or dual enrollment credit. That could also help you uh, not be at UCLA for a long time. So uh, more than 80% uh, of our students will graduate uh, within those four years. Uh, when we talk about retention rate, what we're talking about is uh, continuing from year one to year two, continuing from your freshman year to your sophomore year. Uh, and almost all of our students do. Uh, so unless uh, they were some really uh, excellent um, um, athletes that might have gone professionally early, uh, a lot of our students will come back from year one to year two. And our graduation rate, 90% uh, of our students graduate. So uh, I do think of the entrepreneurs who might leave a little bit early or uh, professional athletes, uh, or uh, some of our athletes who turn professional early, but otherwise a lot of our students who start this uh, process, they finish this process. They come back for their sophomore year and then they come back to graduate. Uh, and then some of our students, uh, maybe they want to uh, pursue graduate school. Maybe they want to uh, find that four-year degree uh, or that uh, uh, medical degree or go to law school. Uh, and so you can see at the bottom of your screen, a lot of our students have gone on to some wonderful institutions. Uh, some students will go on the East Coast, some will stay out here on the West Coast, uh, some students will uh, find their way in the middle of the country, but we send our students to a lot of top 25 institutions, some Ivy schools, so a lot of wonderful graduate institutions. Uh, and then they're also working with a lot of um, Fortune 500 companies and, uh, uh, after they graduate. Sometimes students can find these opportunities even before they graduate. A lot of these Fortune 500 companies, they understand the caliber of student that graduates from UCLA. So a lot of times they're not waiting until you graduate to find you and give you a job. Uh, we do have a lot of research fairs and internship fairs. We wanna make sure that you guys have opportunities to find these, uh, uh, to find employment even before you graduate. Uh, and because of our proximity to uh, a lot of different industries, uh, whether it's Silicon Beach, uh, so all those tech firms, uh, to uh, places like Disney, to the aerospace and engineering firms, uh, LA is in a very good area, not just for your education, but for what you do after you get your degree. Uh, moving on, I know it's, uh, it's gonna be a little bit uh, different talking about academic opportunities. Um, if it were a more normal period, uh, we offer something called the UCLA experience where you can sit in on a real UCLA class. Uh, and incidentally, today would have been that first day of class. Uh, UCLA is on the quarter system and today would have been the first day of instruction. Last week was move-in weekend, students would have had uh, opportunities just to get settled in and move all of your belongings in. Today would have been the first day of classes. And then uh, in a couple of weeks time, we would have allowed you prospective students to be part of that UCLA experience and sit in on these classes. Uh, I don't think we're gonna be able to do it anytime soon, but uh, if I do have younger viewers in the room, if you are junior, sophomores, freshmen, uh, maybe you'll have the opportunity to take part in the UCLA experience uh, at a future time. So uh, what I wanna do is also talk about majors for a little bit. And I know that uh, throughout uh, higher ed week, you've been exposed to a lot of different uh, colleges and universities. Uh, they all have different offerings. For us, we have uh, enough majors and minors that we'd like to think we're big enough for you to study in any field and in any combination. So in terms of new majors, uh, we have two more. So a lot of students have lately uh, decided that they wanna get into the educational profession and teach. So education and social transformation is one of our newest majors. Uh, and LA is also uh, part of the recording industry. So having uh, music history and industry as a major uh, is also a new and cool thing for us to have. Uh, we also have uh, more than 90 different minors for you to choose from. And this might be a question that we get in the UC, uh, in the um, uh, Q and A session later, but uh, if some of you are wondering how to minor, it's not something that you can select on the UC application right now. So once you're admitted to UCLA, then you can choose among any of the 90 different minors that we offer. So I wanna to go to this screen really quickly. And uh, what you see on the screen is actually a QR code. So if you have a smartphone uh, or, or smart device nearby, uh, you can take your uh, phone and kind of take a look at the um, QR code and that will give you a full list of all of the majors that we have. Now, uh, I color coded these things for a specific reason. So I wanna give you uh, an idea of what it means uh, where we talk about college versus school. So for all the 125 plus majors that we offer, uh, most of those majors are in the College of Letters and Science. So that's the blue uh, um, text that I highlighted first. So any major that's in the College of Letters and Science, I want you to know a few things. The only expectation that we have of you is the UC application. So that's all we want. So if your major is anything in the College of Letters and Science, 
the only expectation is the UC application and that's it. Now, if you're considering any of the other majors on the screen, so if it's uh, some of our programs in our College of Engineering or Theater, Film and Television or School of Arts and Architecture, School of Music or School of Nursing, these other programs, they might ask you to do something else. A lot of times, uh, these programs may require a supplemental application. So there is going to be a demonstration of your talent in addition to the UC application. So hopefully I haven't confused you. Hopefully everything is making sense so far, but just to recap, every major at UCLA, you will be required to submit a UC application. But depending on uh, your actual major, uh, there could be something else. Uh, engineering, there is no supplemental application. So for any viewers today watching, wondering what else do I have to do besides the UC application, you don't have to do anything else. Uh, all we want from you is just the application. If you have taken subject tests, that could be a good thing to include. And we will talk about standardized test scores uh, in just a little bit. Otherwise, for all the majors uh, below engineering, so TFT, that, as we call it, theater, film, and television, arts and architecture, music, or nursing, there's almost, almost always a demonstration of talent that's required. Either a portfolio, an audition, maybe some writing samples, in the case of nursing, an application, so you do have to do something else. You have to submit something else uh, besides the UC app. And uh, that's what our expectations are for you between letters and science versus everything outside of it. Now, some students might have questions about double majoring. Uh, the UC application allows for two majors that you can apply for, but we can tell you at UCLA, we get way too many applications. We get a lot. And because of the volume of applications that we receive, we're only considering what we put uh, in your, or what you put in your first choice major. So uh, all of these other programs that uh, are on the screen, theater, film and television, art, arts and architecture, music, nursing, uh, if, if those departments uh, don't find your audition favorable, if they don't like your portfolio, if it's not well received, a lot of times uh, that's where we end the conversation. And so uh, you're denied outright from UCLA uh, otherwise, if you wanted to double major, it really depends on which program you're trying to uh, apply for first. Uh, oftentimes, you need consideration from both departments. So if you want to major in two of these different uh, colleges or schools, you have to gain consent from both departments. And then once you do, uh, if both departments agree, then you are allowed to double major. So it's not going to be up to me. It's going to be up to the departments that you are uh, trying to double major. in. So I know that was a lot of information, but I'm happy to circle back in case anyone has questions. Now, uh, I think one of the other more commonly asked questions that we get, uh, how large would classes be at a place like UCLA? Uh, you just said that, or I just said that uh, we have a large student population, but uh, we try to keep everything as small as we can. We are very intentional about how many students we admit so that we can keep classes uh, more manageable. So uh, like you see you know, on the screen in front of you, for every three classes that you have, two out of those three will have less than 30 students. So we wanna make sure we keep uh, classes as small as possible so that you have ways to interact and get more face time with your uh, uh, faculty and your professors. And uh, this may be a question that we get later, but uh, who is teaching you, who is leading those courses? Uh, at a research institution like UCLA, your lectures are always taught by professors. Uh, that third bullet point at the bottom of the screen, sometimes those large uh, classes that we have, you might have smaller discussion groups to supplement what you learn. And in these small discussion groups, these are typically where you might have uh, smaller uh, groups that are led by your graduate assistants or TAs. So always, uh, lectures are always taught by uh, professors or faculty. Uh, your uh, smaller breakout groups are always led, are not always led, but uh, sometimes led by professors or by TAs. Uh, and then we do have a, a very respectable 18 to one student to faculty ratio. So that gives you a better idea of how large our classes are or how small they are and uh, the number of faculty that we have around. Let's see, uh, if you want, there are other ways to keep classes even smaller, class sizes. So uh, the, uh, the screen uh, shows you two different options, either Fiat Lux seminars or clusters. So uh, these are optional programs designed to keep uh, classes even smaller to give you more face time with your professors. Uh, Fiat Lux, you might be wondering what does that mean? Fiat Lux is Latin and it's uh, let there be light. So these seminars, they are uh, capped at 20. So no more than 20 students can be in that seminar uh, and they're one unit pass, no pass seminars. And we wanted to make sure that it was more discussion based that you could uh, be around other people who might have similar interests and uh, having that smaller discussion, uh, discussion space allows you to uh, keep it more conversational. Uh, there are times when our own chancellor, Jean Block, will teach these seminars. 
Uh, so from time to time, you do get some face time with uh, some really tremendous faculty on campus. Uh, if that's not something that you want to do, if you don't want to participate in uh, Fiat Lux seminars, we also offer something called clusters. Clusters are year-long interdisciplinary classes. So I just gave you a lot of words right there. Uh, clusters are, uh, it's a very efficient way to fulfill your general ed requirements. Think of them as one subject, one class that's taught by six or seven different teachers. So you get six or seven different perspectives all on one subject and students who uh, take these clusters, you can fulfill your general ed requirements, which also help you uh, graduate faster uh, and get you more competitive for any of the other majors that we might have on campus in case you're uh, considering switching majors. Uh, I also wanted to highlight some uh, other faculty that we have on campus here. Uh, some award-winning faculty, uh, Charlene Villasenor-Black and uh, Aragon Ojan. Uh, Charlene Villasenor-Black uh, is uh, an award-winning faculty member. Uh, she uh, most recently won the 2016 Gold Shield Faculty Prize uh, because of her work and her ability to, uh, uh, her uh, grant writing abilities. She's received a lot of grants and a lot of funding from a lot of um, very respectable resources like the Getty, uh, the Fulbright, uh, among others. So we're very fortunate enough to have her here. Uh, the other gentleman at the bottom of the screen is also someone that we're proud of, Professor Eidegen Ojan. Um, popular science calls him one of the world's most brilliant inventors. Uh, he leads the uh, bio and nanophotonics lab in the electrical engineering department. And so uh, he's holding a cell phone microscope. And uh, because of his ability to develop something like this, He's been able to help solve global, global health issues uh, all around the world. And he's given his students some opportunities to uh, develop add-ons to that microscope. So we very much believe in research. We very much believe in this ability for you to uh, kind of get your hands dirty and get some research experience before you graduate. So uh, this would be a good opportunity to talk about research because I think that's the other commonly asked question that we get from uh, students and parents. Like how early can I get involved with it? What can I do? Are there enough projects for me to uh, participate in? And so to answer some of those questions, um, we, get, uh, a lot, we have a lot of opportunities on campus. Uh, I don't know how it's going to look this year because of COVID and because uh, of our remote learning, but uh, in more traditional times, um, more than half of our students will graduate with some sort of research experience in their fields. So when we talk about research, uh, it, it isn't always people in lab coats and goggles. We have two undergraduate research centers on campus. Uh, we have one for our STEM majors. So uh, that's something that's a little more uh, obvious. Uh, what's also, uh, what's not obvious is our undergraduate research center for uh, the arts and humanities students. So as an arts or humanities student at UCLA, uh, you will also have the opportunity to perform research. Uh, we have two of these research centers uh, at the base of the dorms. So I'll talk about housing in a little bit, but if you choose to live on campus, uh, it's going to be very difficult to uh, not uh, walk by these research centers. Think of them like real life uh, Bruin versions of LinkedIn. You can walk into that building and you can uh, find all the different opportunities to work with uh, specific faculty or just kind of see what opportunities are available either on campus or in the greater LA area. And with over a billion dollars in research funding, that's a lot of money to keep uh, these research projects going. And uh, at any given time, there are more than 6,000 funded research projects because uh, a lot of money, a billion dollars, goes a long way uh, to keep these projects going. So just a little more information about uh, research on campus. Now, um, I know it's uh, the COVID era, so I know it's really hard to uh, talk about something as fun as studying abroad when a lot of us aren't really to uh, travel uh, for uh, non-essential purposes. But uh, we do believe in studying abroad. We do believe in uh, global partnerships. We uh, do believe in creating uh, more globally aware citizens. So we want to make sure that when it is safe for you to travel, that you do have the option to study abroad. And uh, I hope that you all take it. Uh, on the screen in front of you are some airport codes. Uh, I can't say that I've been to all of these airports, but that would be something I'd love to do right now, especially as many of us have been stuck at home. Uh, I know a lot of us are itching to get out of the house or go somewhere a little further. So uh, I hope that when the time is safe, if you are a UCLA student, you are able uh, to travel to some of these places. Uh, we've sent our students to more than 115 different programs across 40 different countries. Um, you don't have to know the foreign, a foreign language. You don't have to know the language of the country you're trying to visit. So uh, don't feel like those will be impediments for you. You will have the opportunity uh, to go to these places. Uh, I think the other thing I want to share is that 
Uh, for some students, maybe they just uh, want the, the, uh, the, the taste of going abroad without committing to a longer period. And so we have a study abroad, uh, abroad program that will let you study for as little as three weeks uh, overseas. Uh, if you don't wanna be gone for too long, some students will uh, be, uh, they wanna be a little more courageous. So you can study abroad for an entire quarter. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but UCLA is on the quarter system. So 10 weeks of instruction and then finals week and then a break. So uh, you can go as little as three weeks abroad. You can study abroad for a whole quarter. If you're really adventurous, you can go abroad for a whole year. Uh, and almost all of our majors encourage you to study abroad. So even things like engineering, uh, you'll have the opportunity to study abroad as well. So uh, we really believe in that. Now, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, living on campus. I know this seems kind of out of reach also because uh, again, we're in quarantine, uh, but in more traditional times, uh, this would have been the weekend that you'd move into our campus. This would be move-in weekend. Uh, this would have been when you would uh, meet new students, maybe new students from your own high school, or you get to meet new people and you get to create a lot of lifelong friendships uh, in the dorms. What I wanted to let you know is that uh, we let you decide if you wanna live on campus. So a lot of other colleges and universities, uh, they make it mandatory for you to live on campus. For us, it's truly optional. So you get to decide if you want to live on campus uh, for your first year or potentially through all three uh, or four years, I should say. Uh, before COVID, we had a three-year housing guarantee. So if you were admitted as an incoming freshman, we could promise you three years of living on campus. Uh, what we were trying to do was to guarantee a fourth year. So it may not be too far off in the distance that you would have a fourth year uh, of housing if you wanted to live on campus. So again, it's not mandatory, it's optional, uh, but about 97% or 98% of our students uh, that are coming in as freshmen, they choose to live on campus. And if you do so, you'll have access to uh, some, uh, some really cool opportunities. Uh, for example, living learning opportunities, uh, think of these, or living learning uh, communities, think of them as like a themed floor. Uh, you can live on the same floor with people ha that have the same interest as you, or that have the same background or the same major as you. So you can live with like-minded people, or you can go completely random and live with uh, newer people entirely. Uh, food is also something that a lot of our students ask about. We have some of the best food, not just uh, on campus or in LA, but our dining halls and our dining options have been voted some of the best throughout the country. So two of the last three years, UCLA has been known to have the best food around the country. So we do have wonderful uh, dining options. Uh, and we have another exercise community also. So if you want to uh, work out, but not necessarily go all the way to campus to work out, uh, you do have some options uh, just at the base of your uh, dorms. So that's also what it's like. Uh, the other fun thing that I'll share, which uh, I hope uh, won't get derailed in 2028, but as I uh, mentioned earlier, the Olympics are coming back to Los Angeles in eight years. So when the Olympics come back, uh, we get to host Olympic Village. So the athletes of the Summer Olympic Games of 2028 will live uh, on our campus. So uh, just another cool thing to share with all of you, your dorm could be a future Olympians dorm in the next couple of years. Um, I think tr in trying to anticipate some of your questions, I know a lot of students ask, um, how do I make my application stand out? Like, what do I do to uh, make myself look better? Well, one of those things is how you talk about your involvement, all of the clubs and different organizations that we offer. So uh, I'm going uh, off topic just for a little bit, but uh, one of the ways that you can make your application look better is talking about your leadership and your participation and your involvement in all of the clubs uh, that you've joined since the start of high school. And uh, the reason why we have so many different clubs at UCLA is because uh, students that we admit are really passionate about their pursuits and their interests. And so all those things that you were able to do for three or four years in high school, you'll have similar opportunities to continue those passions once you get to UCLA. So there is uh, quite the different collage of all the different uh, posters from, uh, from our clubs and organizations wanting you to join, but we have more than 1,200 different student clubs and orgs for you to take part in. So uh, just know that when you get to UCLA, when the time comes that we can all uh, be together, uh, you can still pursue uh, the very same activities that you uh, took part in while in high school. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about something called the additional comments section. And I know it's not part of the screen, but it is part of this topic here. Um, I know that COVID-19 has uh, interrupted a lot of our routines. Uh, COVID-19 has disrupted these routines to a point where some of the things that you wanted to do this fall, you're not able to do. Some things can't be done virtually. 
So if uh, you have been involved or you were planning to get involved this year, but you can't because of COVID, make sure that you talk about that in the UC application. Talk about it in the additional comments section. By using the additional comments section to your advantage, you can tell us why you weren't able to take part in anything this year. Uh, so that way you're connecting the dots for us. That way there's no interpretation on our end. Uh, by using the additional comments section to explain uh, the lack of um, extracurriculars you might have, uh, that'll help give us an idea of what you had planned on doing, um, but wouldn't uh, otherwise be able to do because of COVID. So again, more information, we can always circle back to this uh, when we take questions at the end. Now, um, I don't know if you've been able to come to campus before. I don't know if um, the drive from Imperial County to Westwood is something that you would wanna do voluntarily. So I know it's a really long distance, but if you wanted to see what campus looked like, this is the best view that we have. It's a nice overhead view, and it kind of gives you an idea of where we are in relation to the city of Los Angeles. So uh, to give you an idea of uh, where we are, um, if you want some bearings, the bottom of the screen is west, the top of the screen is east, the left of the screen is north, the right of the screen is south. And so what you're looking at is an overview um, where the bottom of the screen represents west and the cluster of buildings that you see at the bottom of the screen, uh, that is uh, the dorms, that's the hill, that's the area that I was just talking about. So if you live on the hill, you are going to be on the west end of campus. Uh, from where we are, um, Pacific Ocean is just a few miles away. Depending on if you're trying to go to Malibu, uh, Santa Monica, or Venice, they're anywhere from three to five miles away from campus. Now, as I said before at the start of the presentation, or maybe you missed it, UCLA is the smallest of all nine UC campuses when it comes to physical size. So uh, our campus is very compact, it's very small. And uh, what I can also tell you is that if you're admitted to UCLA as an arts or humanities major, uh, most of the time you'll find your classes towards the U in UCLA. So we would call you a North Campus major because that's where most of the arts and humanities and social science majors are. Uh, if you're admitted to UCLA as a STEM major, a lot of times your classes might be on the South side of campus. So we might call you a South Campus major. So a lot of your classes would be, toward, uh, would be towards the A in UCLA. So it's a very compact campus. Uh, next to uh, some nice communities, but I know that uh, downtown LA is about 10 miles east. Um, Hollywood is off in the distance. Uh, if you have to travel to LAX for any reason, LAX is about uh, eight to 10 miles south of campus. So that gives you an idea of where we're located. Now this is where we talk about scholarships and money for just a second. And so I know this is kind of a bit of a um, sensitive topic. Um, so I, I wanna uh, just tread carefully here uh, the first thing I wanted to mention was that um, UCLA is need blind. And if that's not a term you're familiar with, I'm happy to explain that. Sometimes we ask you sensitive questions like, how much money does your family make? When we ask you about being need blind, we're really just trying, or when we ask you questions about your household, household income, uh, we're trying to get an idea of your family's context and your circumstances and your situation. But the amount of money your family makes has no effect on our decision making. But what it does is has, it helps give us a better perspective of who you are and what's going on at home. But sometimes if you answer such a question like uh, how, how much money my family makes, it gives us an idea of the kinds of scholarships that you uh, might be eligible for. So we have a lot of scholarships that are need-based and I know a lot of uh, students are looking for merit-based scholarships. So need-based scholarships are kind of based on your circumstances at home and how much you need this money. Uh, so these money, uh, these scholarship opportunities are scholarships, grants, and work study, uh, but combined, um, you can get a lot of money just out of uh, scholarships, grants, and work study alone. If you look at the screen, more than half of our students uh, that graduated this past year had no student loan debt. So I know that there might be some questions about how much would it cost to attend UCLA. We are committed to making this as uh, financially uh, possible for your families. Uh, and uh, most of our students who do have some debt, uh, a lot of times they graduate with uh, less debt than uh, the average graduate in the United States. So if you're looking for scholarships, let me give you some advice. In the UC application, you can apply for need-based scholarships uh, very easily. I know a lot of you are looking for merit-based scholarships. Uh, some of you are looking for the larger checks, the bigger prizes, the larger sums of money. If you're looking for merit-based scholarships, 
uh, that process is not automatic at UCLA. So you've got to do your part and do the work and search for those scholarships and those deadlines. But you can go on our Office of Financial Aid and Scholarships website now so that you can get an idea of what they're going to ask you and when those uh, applications are due. A lot of times scholarship applications and admission applications are due. Um, uh, uh, they're due all together or very close to one another. Uh, so try not to wait too long. Uh, don't wait until uh, late in November to start working on them. You might have missed some uh, critical deadlines for scholarships. So uh, I'll leave it at that. I wanna talk about just kind of a timeline. This gives you an idea of our expectations for uh, the year. So this really depends. Um, a lot of what you see on the screen is meant for current seniors, but if you're a junior or a sophomore or freshman, or if you're even younger than that, don't expect these dates and deadlines to change. A lot of times they're the same no matter what year you're in. So if I can address the seniors very quickly, if your intention is coming to UCLA directly out of high school, the application was made available August 1st. So that was two months ago. Um, it's August 1st, or August 1st was when the application is available. It's October 2nd. So uh, you've already had two months to work on this application. So we've tried to give you as much time as we could. We wanted to make sure that you had fewer distractions uh, during the school year. So we make the application available in the summer. So hopefully you've been working on your application, continuing to craft it and perfect it. Uh, just know that we won't start reading them until um, uh, later in, uh, well, not even later in November. We, we don't start reading them until December. Uh, the entire month of November is when you can submit your application. So for anyone who's started to work on their application and you've gotten to the final screen, there is a submit button that is gray right now. It's gonna turn blue uh, in November. And that's when you can actually submit your application uh, and be done with this process. Uh, I wanna share some uh, other advice with you. We have never cared when you submit. There's no such thing as early action or early decision at UC or UCLA. So if you're first in line, uh, you don't get any benefits. If you're last in line, hopefully you don't procrastinate, but you're not at a disadvantage either. So it doesn't matter when you submit. But uh, I wanna make it clear that we get a lot of applications. The UC system, not just UCLA, but the UC system gets a lot of applications. If you wait till the last hour, the last minute, the last second, if you wait until 11.59 p.m. Pacific time, November 30, and the system crashes, uh, you're gonna lose out on an opportunity to submit your application. So uh, just know that we've given you as much time as possible, but don't wait until the last possible second. Uh, for some students who are applying for FAFSA, make sure that you submit everything by March 2nd because that is the priority deadline. We wanna make sure that you're considered for uh, as many financial aid opportunities as possible. Now for uh, UCLA in particular, we will, notify your, uh, we will not notify you of your decision in late March. If anyone in this room is looking at transferring into UCLA, uh, typically that deadline is uh, late April. So you're just about a month apart from the freshman, but uh, we'll notify you all on the same day at the same time. So we don't release decisions in waves. Uh, there's no uh, wave of decisions. We tell all of you on the same day at the same time of your admission status. So if you're admitted to UCLA in late March as a freshman or late April as a transfer student, we give you about a month. We give you about four or five weeks to uh, review all the information we give you. Your acceptance letter will have uh, your scholarship and financial aid letter. So at the very least, you have an idea of how much money we're giving you. And then you can come together as a family. You can decide based on all the information that we give you, is UCLA the right fit for you? Can you call UCLA home for the next four years? So uh, after you've taken some time to deliberate, hopefully you can make that decision by May 1 or by uh, June 1 if you're coming in as a transfer. So that's what your senior year will look like. And uh, if you're a junior, don't be surprised. Those deadlines, those dates should be the same for the next following years. And um, real quick, before I talk about philosophy, I think there was something that I forgot to mention as well. Directly in the UC application, if you are requesting a fee waiver, you can do it directly through the application itself. So um, there are some questions that you'll see towards uh, the latter end of the application. Depending on how you answer them, you will find out on the spot if you qualify for a fee waiver. Now, uh, a lot of students want to know how we make our decisions, like how, what goes on in our mind when we're reading your applications. So let me give you just the overall general perspective. Uh, this process is very much holistic, and what it means is it's not based on a formula. It's not just grades or scores 
when we talk about holistic, what I mean is there's never one single part about your application that determines admission. So when we read your application, when we admit students, we're saying yes to them for a lot of reasons. It wasn't just one part about their application that stood out. A lot of things stood out and we said yes to them. Now, that also means uh, the same thing when we deny students. If we deny students, it wasn't just because of one part of your application. Unfortunately, there are other parts of the application that we didn't think uh, stood out enough. So uh, it's very much a holistic thing. It's not just grades, it's everything that you've done. Uh, every application is read twice. So we wanna make sure that we have enough eyes on your application before we make a decision. Sometimes we can't reach an agreement, so we might get a third reader involved. And if a consensus isn't reached, if we can't find an agreement, we'll get a fourth reader involved. Sometimes we'll get as many as five readers involved to look at your application before we make this decision. This is why we don't look at your alternate major. By the time two people, three people, four people, five people read your application, we're already gonna be in late February, early March. There's not gonna be another opportunity to look at your application. So we do everything very, uh, uh, very thoroughly. We want to make sure that we read everything about your application before we make any decision. Uh, the third bullet point, all achievements are taken into consideration. Everything that you do with your free time is significant. What we want to do is make sure that you understand your uh, extracurriculars are not just things that happen in the classroom. They're things that you do at home, in your community, in your places of worship, uh, the, the jobs that you work at. So everything you do off campus, everything you do outside of home, all of those things are significant. Uh, and the last thing uh, before we go on to the next slide, we're looking for leaders. We're looking for people who are engaged in their communities. It's one thing just to show up. It's one thing just to go to school. It's just uh, one thing to join a club. But what were your contributions? Did you lead that group? Uh, what were your uh, contributions like? So we don't want you just to join a club. We want you to be able to lead it. And if you find that passion, no matter what it is, uh, I hope that you can talk about it confidently so that we can uh, understand uh, how interested you were in that topic because we are looking for leaders. The kinds of students that we admit to UCLA are typically leaders uh, inside and outside of the classroom. Uh, so I wanna make sure you understand uh, it's your extracurriculars and your leadership in particular that help you stand out more than everybody else. Now some finer points. Uh, I do wanna talk about the UC application and give you a little more general advice. Uh, remember that it's the UC application. So it's not the UCLA application. It's one application for all nine schools. I know there were some questions perhaps about fee waivers. The fee waivers you can apply directly for in the UC application. So depending on your circumstances and however you answer those questions, uh, you might be able to secure as many as uh, four fee waivers. So uh, that's how the UC application works. The other few things I wanted to share with you, uh, we all read the same thing. So if you're applying to multiple UC campuses, all of us are reading the same information. So uh, if you say how much you love UCLA, I don't know how, it, uh, it, I don't know how that would uh, affect the people uh, at UC Berkeley when you're applying to them. If you're applying to UC San Diego and you say you love UCLA, I don't know if you're gonna hurt their feelings. So if you wanna be a part of the UC system, that's great. And we're all working towards that same mission. But just remember, we all read the same thing. It's uh, one application for all nine schools. Um, what I wanna talk about next is the academic history. And this is where we talk about your performance uh, inside the classroom. A lot of you are worried about your grades. Uh, I just uh, said in the previous slide, it's a holistic process. So grades are not the only thing that we pay attention to. We also look at how hard your classes were. Did you have a rigorous uh, schedule? Uh, did you take as many honors courses as you could handle or as many AP courses as you could handle? Were you taking uh, dual enrollment courses? Were you able to uh, succeed in those areas? So we're paying attention to your academic history and to the rigor of your courses. Uh, we wanna see that, uh, that you've been trending upward. We wanna see that uh, even if you started high school poorly, we just wanna see that you keep going up and up and that um, everything related to you is up, uh, your grades, uh, your involvement, your leadership. We hope that everything is trending upward. Um, grades are self-reported. That's the second bullet point. Uh, we don't wanna see transcripts right now because we don't need to see the paperwork. We're not asking for the receipts right now. Uh, what we're going to do is wait until after you're admitted. So it's after that we give you an acceptance letter that you have to send us all of your official do uh, documents. So your official transcripts and everything, that's not uh, something we're gonna ask for right now. We'll ask for that later. Uh, activities and achievements in and out of the classroom. This is where we talk a little bit more about your extracurriculars. 
Uh, and I want you to know that um, if, if you haven't been able to pursue those same interests, if uh, COVID-19 has prevented you from um, uh, playing sports or doing other things um, in the space of other people, and we have to be socially distant, uh, you can use uh, the additional comments section to talk about, um, uh, talk about that. You can talk about why you weren't able to pursue so many things this year because of COVID-19. Uh, or if uh, your extracurricular activities have become virtual, uh, you can use the additional comments section to say that you've uh, pivoted and transitioned into a virtual platform. So we'll try to give you as many outs as possible, but use the additional comments section to your advantage. Um, it's always been told, I've always been told uh, to students, uh, I've always told them rather, um, think about how much time you spent playing that same uh, sport or volunteering at that same hospital. Try to quantify all of your activities. Tell us how long you've spent doing that same thing uh, or playing that same uh, instrument or that same sport. Quantify all of these things for us. Uh, when we talk about achievements, uh, I have to remind everybody, there's no recommendation letter in this process. We're not gonna ask you to interview with us. We're not gonna ask you for recommendation letters. We're not gonna set up personal Zoom calls with any of you. So the only way that we get to know how special you are is when you tell us these things. So when you talk about your achievements, what I hope is that you can kind of uh, give us more context. Tell us how special it was. Tell us how hard it was to earn that award. Qualify these activities for us. Tell us if you were the best on your team or the best uh, in your school district, if you were the best uh, in the league, the best in the state, the best in the nation, the best in the world. Give us as much context. Qualify all of your achievements for us. Uh, if you can uh, quantify and qualify, a lot of times you're going to give us the clarity that we're looking for. Um, and then personal insight questions. These are what students have uh, mistakenly called college essays. I don't like calling them essays because I don't want to give you the wrong idea or uh, give you the wrong approach. Uh, there are eight personal insight questions or PIQs. What I want you to know is that these are uh, the questions in which we get to know you outside of your academics. Uh, some students may have different approaches, but I've always tried to tell students, if you think of them like job interview questions where you get straight to the point, that's kind of the best way that we get to know who you are. Sometimes uh, not students, not every student write well creatively. So if you take the creative writing approach, sometimes we might misinterpret that or we may not understand your references. So that's not always the best way to uh, answer these questions. So I've always favored um, or not favored, but I've always uh, preferred that students try to answer them a little more directly. That way there's no misinterpretation. That way you're uh, connecting the dots for us. Uh, and then as I said earlier, there might be su some supplemental applications depending on the programs that you apply for. So if you're considering any majors that are a little more specialized, don't be surprised if we ask you for a portfolio, an audition, a writing sample, or anything else. Now, uh, this is probably one of the last few slides I wanna talk about before we take some questions. So I know that we're almost at the point that we're gonna uh, get questions, but I wanted to talk about testing updates very quickly. This is a little controversial because uh, the circumstances are fluid. So as I look at the calendar, and today is October 2nd, uh, what I want you to know is that as of today, October 2nd, 2020, UC is test optional. So uh, that's, uh, that's how we are currently operating. So on the screen, it says UC, not just UCLA. UC is test optional as of today, October 2nd, 2020. Now, uh, things may change. Uh, there might be some uh, rule, court rulings that make us go test blind immediately. But for right now, uh, there's not much more that we can say or comment on because it's not up to us. Uh, it's uh, up to the courts and to the, uh, uh, the court system to decide if UC will be test blind or test optional. So as of today, again, and I'm looking at my uh, calendar, my watch, as of October 2nd, 2020, we are test optional. So for current seniors and for current juniors who are watching this presentation right now, that means you have the option of including your test scores. Um, if you exclude your scores, if you do not include your scores, you will not be at a disadvantage. You will still get full consideration. You can still get admitted without an SAT or ACT score present. So remember, uh, as I said just a few slides ago, we have a holistic process. So if we admit students, we admit them for a lot of reasons, not just because their test scores, uh, not just because of their grades. Same thing if we deny students. We've denied students not for just one reason, unfortunately for a lot of other reasons. So what I wanna tell you is that it's test optional. It's up to you to decide if you want to include that score, but that is as of today, 
October 2nd, 2020. Now, uh, you also see that we can be test blind in the near future. So that's for current uh, sophomores and current freshmen. So that's just to give you an idea of where we're at as of today. Let me see. Um, I want to just plug this really quick and then I think we'll be at a point where we take questions. So I'm almost at the end. Um, open house and driving to Westwood wasn't something that um, most folks could do, especially out in Imperial County. But this year, open house is virtual and we want to reduce Zoom fatigue. So starting next Monday, October 5th, all the way through October 10th, we have a lot of open house uh, events that are virtual. They're going to be online so that you can see them. A lot of these sessions repeat. A lot of them are uh, going to be recorded so that you can come back and watch them at another time. I know one of the more popular sessions will be an application, or sorry, not an application, a uh, financial aid workshop. So uh, if you want to learn more about uh, financial aid and scholarships at UCLA, that's going to be one of those sessions that we repeat starting next week. So if you go to UCLA's admission page, you can sign up for Open House. We'll give you a link to register. It's going to be on Zoom and um, yeah, you'll be able to participate in a lot of the workshops that happen throughout the week. Otherwise, uh, I'm almost done and then we'll take questions, but these are more QR codes. These are other ways for you to stay connected with us. Uh, a lot of times when we visit schools uh, physically, we would hand uh, students brochures, uh, but since we're all working from home, I don't have a way to get those brochures or to mail them to you. So that publication library QR code at the bottom of the screen, if you took your smartphone and you uh, took a picture of that QR code, you're gonna be able to see an electronic library of all the different brochures that we have. If you wanna sign up for a live virtual tour, you can do the same thing. Uh, we'll give you a, a live tour narrated by official UCLA tour guides. And then we do have other ways for you to stay connected with us, either through social media or our mailing list. So I'm gonna leave that up there for like three more seconds while I get a swig of water. And then I'm gonna leave this part of the screen for now before we take questions. So Todd, I know that you're ready to send some questions my way, but this is just a way for me to let the students know that's how you get a hold of us. So again, another QR code. Uh, there are two emails on the screen. Uh, the one at the top is obviously my direct email, but if I'm not able to answer your question today, you can follow up with me or use the other email address. The one, uh, the one at the bottom of the screen is to the admission office. So any one of our admission advisors uh, will either um, answer via email or if you call us over the phone Monday through Friday from one to four, you'll be able to get a hold of us there too. So Todd, let me take a deep breath because that was a lot of information in a short amount of time. But uh, what's on the viewers' minds? What kinds of questions have we received and what else can I do for your students? Thanks, uh, Barry. Yeah, take a swig and, uh, and take a breath. And uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Let me just say that. Uh, it, it's been great to have uh, UCLA uh, as one of our uh, higher ed uh, representatives uh, during these past two weeks uh, with today. Uh, we've, a lot of us has been looking forward to this, uh, this segment. Uh, UCLA, one of the most prestigious universities in the nation. And, uh, and so we're glad you're joining us. And as you can imagine, there are a lot of students who've been asking questions because uh, it's a very popular university. So uh, of course. not in any one particular order, because they came in a whole bunch of different ways. Uh, but uh, just to quick, in fact, let's leave this uh, slide up here, by the way. So leave this slide up. So if students, if uh, maybe they logged in late, missed some of the Miss some of the slides, miss maybe some of the beginning part of the presentation. Also, by the way, I'll just mention to everybody uh, that we're recording the session and uh, we'll be adding this along with every other uh, of our hours of these past two weeks uh, to our uh, YouTube channel for the Imperial County Office of Education. You can go down and search for UCLA and uh, you can go backwards and slide and, and, and see the presentation a little bit later. But if you'd like to contact UCLA and in particular the admissions office, the contact information is on the screen right now. Speaking of uh, admissions, uh, one of the, 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 the more general questions that we received, and, and, I'll, and I'll mention this to you in particular, because I think at the beginning you listed your, your department as admissions, one of the assistant directors in admissions. So my presumption is you're probably one of the people who read uh, applications from high school seniors applying to UCLA. So mm -hmm. I preface that just to perk up the ears of the students who are listening right now. So when you are accepting, uh, when you're looking, what are you guys looking for when you're admitting students to school? You have this packet that now may not have an SAT or an ACT test associated with it. Uh, it's not gonna be part of the admission process. So what, 
more so are you looking for in an admission application? Um, this is the part where I have to uh, reiterate what I said earlier about a holistic review. And so when we say that our review process is holistic, um, there's never like one factor or one single thing about your application that would make me say yes or make me say no. So you get a lot of students who uh, maybe have uh, really high grades and really uh, strong involvement in their courses, but they're worried about that SAT or ACT. Um, sometimes it's not the SAT or ACT that makes or breaks you. I mean, there's still other uh, parts of your ap application that I'm going to look at. Uh, to see if you would succeed at UCLA. So um, too many students place an emphasis just on the SAT or ACT. Let me remind everybody, uh, your GPA in particular, I know it's one thing, but it's a better overall uh, understanding of how well you've done because that GPA was earned throughout the course of a year. Uh, your SAT score or your ACT score, that was reflective of just one day out of your entire high school career. So you get a lot of students who put uh, so much emphasis on uh, one day's uh, test, one day's efforts, instead of, um, uh, and, and they otherwise forget that we're also looking at what they've done throughout the course of their four years. So don't try to put too much emphasis on just one test alone with this SAT or ACT. Uh, we are looking for uh, how you've spent your free time, whether it was helping the community, whether it was playing an instrument or sport or volunteering, we are looking at uh, what you've done outside of the classroom and off campus. So your leadership, uh, your involvement, uh, the way you've been able to impact your family uh, and your school, these are a lot of the other things that we pay attention to also. So big picture, not just one test, but we're looking at big picture and everything else. Well, that's good to hear because a big test here in Imperial County is not even really a, an option for the most part of these students. So there isn't a, there isn't a testing site available to take the, uh, the SAT. So uh, that's good to hear. Uh, however, one student had a concern, uh, do admissions officers think about family circumstances uh, that may prevent them from being involved in extracurricular activities or having a job or, or volunteering at the hospital, uh, but they're yes. real busy in the home? Yes, absolutely. And this is something that a lot of students, for some reason, they feel shy uh, in talking about. This is exactly what we want to hear. We realize that you guys are human beings, that you have a lot of other obligations. Now, if you're anyone like me or Todd, like family's big to you. And so if you have a lot of obligations at home, you should definitely talk about that in the application. So a lot of students think extracurriculars are just the clubs or after school sports. Your extracurriculars also involve your home responsibilities. So if you've been taking care of siblings, like if you have to pick them up after school, uh, before you go home, if you have to uh, feed them and bathe them and cook dinner for them before you start on your own homework. These are things that we want to hear about. If you have these kinds of fa uh, family obligations that prevent you from uh, working after school or, uh, or doing anything else, you should absolutely talk about that in the UC application. So I don't want you to think that what you do at home doesn't matter. Um, taking care of your uh, elderly uh, um, uh, family members, that's also another thing that happens. Sometimes you have to pick uh, your uh, brother and sister up from uh, school or take your aunts and uncles or your grandparents to their medical appointments. All of that are examples of caretaking. And caretaking is uh, a responsibility that we wanna hear about. So uh, if you feel like uh, you don't have anything to talk about in the UC application uh, because of all these things, you're wrong. You, have, you absolutely do have a lot of things to talk about. So talk about what your commitments are to your family. Those are just as important as anything else. Now you mentioned that the UC application has been out since August 1st, but if yes. a student maybe uh, hasn't got an opportunity to look at that, there's a month left to kind of prep it before they begin to turn that in. Uh, where would they begin to talk about those things? I'm assuming you're referring to the personal insight questions. There's going to be a lot of different spaces for you to uh, share uh, your family context or just your personal context. So let's try to give you some ideas here. Um, one of the areas in which you can talk about that would be the additional comments section. So that's more of a free form field. It's just a big uh, paragraph box and uh, you, can, uh, you can add more information there. So uh, there are eight personal insight questions. Uh, you only have to answer four. The max uh, word count is 350. Sometimes for students, 350 words for a response is not long enough. So if you want to add more detail to your personal insight questions, use the additional comments section. If you feel like you have a lack of extracurriculars, 
uh, use the additional comment section to explain your circumstances that you have to uh, pick up uh, siblings from school or take uh, 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 take your other family members to their appointments. So it's up to you to fill out and maximize these spaces to explain maybe all of the holes or all of the anomalies in your application. There's also another section called additional academic comments. And that's a section that a lot of people don't know how to use either. Now, I know that uh, all of you are, are so focused on uh, having high grades, but there might be some times where you slip. There might be some moments where um, some other circumstances that you couldn't control kind of uh, prevented you from doing so well in class. Uh, maybe there was an accident, a, a car accident, uh, uh, or maybe your parent lost a job. Maybe something really catastrophic happened that impacted you that kind of took your eyes and focus off for a moment. And so that A minus that you otherwise had turned into a C plus. Use the additional academic comment section to explain some of these things that perhaps you're not proud of as it relates to your academics. You know, so it, it's very forgiving. The application, uh, if you know how to use it, if you know all of these areas and what to do with it, you can explain a lot of your circumstances uh, and it's a lot more forgiving if you explain rather than just leaving them blank. It gives us more context into your personal life and to the circumstances you were dealing with at the time. Okay, man, it's like getting close to four, four o'clock. So let's get you through okay. here on a couple quick ones. Uh, okay. A lot of students have asked questions about, hey, do you have this major, do you have that major? Uh, at the beginning of your slide deck, you had a, a slide that listed that. So I just wanna encourage students, you can Google another thing or you can go back in the video and so I, I pulled it up on my phone right now. I was taking a look at it and it lists all the different majors at UCLA. So it's a great uh, way to reference that. Uh, but real quick, I'll end it with this question and you might have some other summary thoughts you would squeeze in too. Uh, we all consider UCLA a very prestigious university with lots of rigor. So uh, my fear is that if I'm a student, uh, I would have a lot of trepidation about going to a big university like UCLA. What would happen if, if on my first you know, test, I, I bomb it and get an F? Are there academic support programs uh, that would be uh, available to a student who is uh, feeling a little, little overwhelmed after their first quarter? Oh, absolutely. And we expose you to all of these resources at orientation. So I know that this past summer orientation was virtual, but a lot of times orientation is on campus for three days and we walk you from building to building. We actually give you a more in-depth detailed uh, tour of campus. And during that tour, we show you all of these offices that have all of these support services for you. So people like me, my job isn't to bring you to UCLA just so you can fail in the first week. That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to make sure that you graduate, that you have that upward mobility so that you can be the first in your family to graduate from UCLA, or you can be the next person in your family to graduate from UCLA. But all those academic support services, we, we bring you to them. We literally walk you uh, to all of those support services during orientation so that you know where to find them, uh, you know what they can do for you, uh, and you know that you can use them whenever you need them. So it's not something that I talk about uh, generally now in this part of the process because we're trying to get you into UCLA, but once we get you admitted, uh, and especially at orientation and uh, all the events that happen in between, we tell you about all these different departments. Our goal is not to bring you to UCLA uh, just so you can uh, sputter out of control and fail. We're trying to bring you here so that you can succeed. And I know that a lot of you are scared sometimes because it's a new place, it's a prestigious place, but that's not our intention either. We saw something in you that we thought you would be able to succeed. We know that you can do the work. So I know that there's some self-doubt sometimes, but you got to get that out of your head. We brought you onto that campus for a reason. We believe in you. And we had enough people believe in you that they agreed with me. So we want to make sure like you uh, have that confidence, but just in case there's a little slip of confidence, we'll show you where all the different, uh, all the different support services are, uh, whether it's academics or if you, even if it's finding more scholarships, because we have another place where you can look for more scholarships as a UCLA student too. So we're not going to hang you out to dry. We're going to make sure that you have someone to, uh, to hold your hand every step of the way if you need it, if that's the kind of person you are so that you can graduate uh, and be that next Bruin and your family. Wow, Barry, thank you so much. That was like so motivational. I'm like so pumped <laughs> right now um, and excited for our students. Those of you who are on the call with us, uh, look at this amazing support that you have available to you. Uh, Barry at 
UCLA, um, just ready and willing to support you in your application process and all of that good stuff. So Barry, we can't thank you enough for joining us today. Um, you've been so awesome, uh, you know, being here for us in Imperial County and, you know, we'll look forward to hopefully hosting you locally in the near future. But if not, we'll continue to do this virtual thing, right? I hope to be able to do both. So my door is always open, always looking for that inbox invitation from you. So uh, if there's anything, Denise, that you can invite me to, send it my way. For all the students who are still watching, the email address is on the screen, so don't be a stranger. Uh, I know that it's a little bit uh, different these times, but don't be afraid. Uh, we're all in this together. Let us know what we can do for you. Otherwise, uh, good luck. Uh, have a good weekend. Reach out to us, and uh, go Lakers. <laughs> Thanks so much, Barry. Take care, my friend. We'll be in touch.